elected leaders act like school children in front of actual school children. A citizen gave a politician a piece of his mind online. The comment was deleted. Is that legal? A Holocaust survivor asked students, please do not let the world forget. An inmate passing time, making the jail a bit beautiful. And remember the bald eagle mourning its mate after the blizzard. There's a new man in the nest. Next. Our state legislature has devolved to a pretty embarrassing state. Petty tricks and payback, insults and accusations, calling it childish would be an insult to the actual children who were quite well behaved when they came to watch our legislators work. And instead of working, found them arguing. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. Well, I think we can agree on one thing today, that the senatorial courtesy that has existed here for many years is in question. If you thought state senators only care about policy, you have not been inside Capitol Elementary. We do need to get to a place where senatorial courtesy is how we run things around here once again. It was a special day for fourth grade students from Timberline Elementary in Centennial. Instead of having to listen to boring old debate on bills and watching actual votes happen. Bridges, no. They got to watch an argument over attendance. I was actually marked as absent as if I did not do my part in communicating to everybody that I needed to be excused. Republican Senator Jim Smallwood was one of five Republican senators who left early on Friday prior to the red flag bill being voted on. They were marked absent instead of excused, and they wanted that changed. It's important for kids of all ages to know how the process works. Um, and it's not always pretty. It's not always fun and games. And today certainly wasn't fun. As one of the fourth grade teachers told me, she wishes her students had witnessed an actual vote and not a challenge to a previous day's roll call. So we're in kind of a weird tug of war back and forth. And how that tug of war ends, I, I don't know. We are not children. We are not in grade school. We are senators. We are in the Colorado Senate. I hope for the rest of this session we can act like it. It really doesn't matter that five senators were absent because absent, excuse, whatever. The vote still counts the same. You didn't vote. And at least four of those five absences were known ahead of time, just not by the Senate president. So this was clearly about rules and respect and not actual attendance. What we've seen in the Senate is about to bleed over to the House because of that oil and gas bill. It still doesn't have that petition clause that will allow voters to collect signatures to try to overturn what lawmakers are trying to pass here. And the top House Republican just warned me the House Republicans may start stalling. If they just put a petition clause on it in, verse of, in place of a safety clause, then we could continue business as usual. But if they're unwilling to do that, then we're going to be forced to use some of the similar tactics and slow the process down because they're unwilling to give the voters that ability to petition their government. We've not seen relationships like this mm -hmm. work this way. In the House, the majority and minority get along, and Patrick never told me, they get along right now. They don't have that conflict like they have in the Senate, and that could change by next week. Yeah, well, we saw today in the Senate, though, is, is it fair to say that any day that they're not doing actual work, that they're fighting, that's a day that the Republicans win? Because their goal is just to bog it down. Correct, that's a win for the Republicans. But I think yeah. today might be the pinnacle. It, it, should, it should start getting better after today. Oh, you totally jinxed it now. All right, thank you, Marshall. Rural Colorado's revolt against the Democrats' red flag gun control bill continues. As of now, more than half of Colorado's 64 counties have passed resolutions indicating that they will not enforce this if it becomes law. Tonight, the city of Pueblos Council will consider doing the same. And the city of Craig has passed a resolution in support of Moffat County's stand. The most prominent Republican to support that Democratic effort to have judges be able to take guns away from people who are deemed a threat is Douglas County Sheriff Tony Spurlock. Spurlock is now facing a recall over the red flag bill. It's legislation that's named after a fallen Douglas County deputy, Zach Parrish. The people who want to recall Sheriff Spurlock will need 33,751 signatures. It's a quarter of the vote Spurlock got when he was reelected in November. If they can do that, then the recall goes on the ballot. Spurlock has basically said, bring it on. Most of rural Colorado sheriffs say that the Colorado Democrats are not respecting the Second Amendment. Senate President Leroy Garcia is facing a federal lawsuit now accusing him of violating the First Amendment. There's a constituent suing Garcia from blocking this guy from his Facebook page. Our Steve Steger explores a relatively new area of law. 
This story starts right here on this program. There are now two people at the Capitol who appear to have the same job. Back in November, we reported on Democrats in the state Senate firing a nonpartisan staffer. The story upset Pueblo resident Alexander Armijo so much that according to a lawsuit, he called the office of his state senator, Leroy Garcia, and asked for a statement. Armijo says the staffer on the other end of the line said no comment and hung up the phone. So Armijo decided to post his frustration on Garcia's Facebook page in a comment, complete with a link to our story. Days later, the lawsuit says, the comment was deleted and Armijo was blocked from Garcia's Facebook page. Now Armijo is suing Garcia in federal court. A private individual can always block someone they don't like on Facebook or Twitter. But that isn't true if you're using Twitter as a political tool. Nine News Legal Beagle Scott Robinson says these kinds of cases are relatively new ground, but judges seem to find that government officials are different than the rest of us online. The idea that a social media site could be a public forum, is it may seem a little awkward, but in fact, it serves the same purpose as a public meeting. So a spokesman for the Senate Democrats said they have not received the lawsuit yet, so they can't comment on it. But he said he finds it concerning that Armijo and his attorney went to the press before sending the suit to the Senate president. The attorney who's handling this told me today that he has filed two similar cases in Colorado and both have been settled before a judge could rule. Kyle. Speaking of needing a ruling, did you say legal beagle? I did say legal beagle. It's legal eagle. It's legal beagle. I don't think that it's legal beagle, I'm pretty sure. I've heard legal beagle before and legal eagle. Simply the fact that you've heard something does not make it a thing. Okay, all right, viewers will sell this. They settle everything every time. Legal Eagle. We've been keeping you updated on the two groups formed to recall Governor Jared Polis. These groups blame the oil and gas regulations the Democrats are pushing through, along with the, the national popular vote bill and that red flag gun control bill that we talked about. The Greeley Tribune looked into the people who were organizing the recall effort against the governor, and the Trib reports that two leaders of that effort have a history of sharing anti-Semitic posts on Facebook. It's interesting because Polis is Colorado's first Jewish governor. According to the Tribune, Shane Donnelly, one of the administrators of the Recall Colorado Facebook page, has posted that, quote, Hitler was good to the German people. Also mentions that the administrator of the Facebook page, Judy Spady, frequently shares posts blaming Jews for 9-11. While the page encourages people to reach out to the Resist Polis PAC effort, they're not working directly together. They just support a common aim. We have a link to the Greeley Tribune article on the next Facebook page. Denver's latest nonstop international flight has a bit of an asterisk for the time being. We've told you that Cayman Airways cannot promise that it can get passengers to and from the Caribbean without a stop every time because the airline had to ground its Boeing 737 MAX 8 jets. Cayman Airways got back to us with new information about how these heavily advertised nonstop flights would work if a stop is required. A Cayman spokeswoman says they've been successfully making nonstop flights using 737-300s and 767-300s. But if the weather and the flight path and the passenger load all combine to dictate that they need a refueling stop, they will schedule it in advance and passengers will be notified before they board. Cayman says adding a fuel stop should be highly unlikely. Do not adjust your televisions. We're having an audio issue there with that piece of sound. I wasn't actually talking loudly, then talking quietly, then loud again. We'll try to get the audio fixed. Cayman grounded its Boeing 737 MAX 8 fleet before American regulators did the same, before the FAA took action stateside. Cayman specifically added those planes to its fleet in order to be able to do longer nonstop flights like that route to Denver. It's a sign of a confusing and seemingly dangerous situation out at the airport, if you don't know the bigger picture. Next viewer named Billy Masser shared this photo with us of an employee at DIA out smoking on the tarmac. There you see smoking area, but, but look right there, it says no smoking. What, what's in that green box? Is it scary and dangerous? And why would you allow smoking right there if you can't next to the green box? An airport spokesperson says, yes, that is confusing when you look at it like that, but the no smoking sign is not about a danger in the box. It's because there's a door just out of frame of that photo. That's what they don't want people smoking near. So smoke on, DIA employee. You're in the safe zone. Hey, have you ever seen this bad boy rolling around town? You kind of double take. What, what exactly is that? That would appear to be uh, business in the front, taxi in the back. 
Next viewer named Jerry saw the half cop car, half taxi in Golden. So this actually belongs to Golden PD. It's part of their Project Sober Hero program. Metro Taxi donated the vehicle to be turned into a billboard on wheels. It's supposed to get you to think about the dangers of driving drunk. An inmate at the Douglas County Jail is being recognized by his captors, saluted for adding a bit of color to the jail's booking area. On Saturday, he painted an American flag and yesterday added a hero's flag to that area. Captain Darren Weekly shared the photos of the inmates' art on Twitter. Captain Weekly said that the inmates going to be painting something special next week in memory of Dep Deputy Zach Parrish. Captain will share that and we'll pass it along to you. They've read about it. Sad part of history, unfortunately, but it's something we have to educate so we don't repeat it. He talks about it, the worst thing in his life, so that no one will forget. Very interesting to like hear and how scary it was and like, how the hope, I guess, saved his life. Where are we on water? Precipitation below average, snowpack above average? We'll answer your next question. And the bald eagle, left alone after the blizzard, may have a new younger man helping with the nest. Next. Our next question comes from a viewer named Debbie. She wants to know how the average annual precipitation is calculated. Debbie heard that we're still six inches below average with precip, yet our map shows snowpack 100% above average. Nine News meteorologist Kylie Burse explains. The key thing to remember is that snowpack and annual precipitation, two totally different things. With snowpack, we use percentages, and when it comes to rain or snow, we use inches. So how do we get this number that's the average? Well, it's all based on information from the last 30 years. Every time it rains or snows, the National Weather Service sites record how much moisture came down, then that's added to the running yearly total. Add up all of these numbers, then you divide by 30, the National Weather Service will do a little interpolation in there and you end up with that yearly number. Also, we get new averages every 10 years, so next summer we'll have a whole new set of numbers to work with. So interpolation, you heard that word there. That just means in the scientific sense that they're estimating the data points between known values. In this case, from the surrounding locations looked at by the National Weather Service. Fun fact, interpolation in the sense of the spoken word means messing something up by adding a word or something that doesn't belong. Like when Steve Steger said Eagle Beagle. <laughs> Yuka 
go, girl. Way to dazzle them with science and weather facts, Kylie. And you know what? Here it is on Monday. And yeah, it's Monday. But if it's going to be a Monday, how about it looks like this? Sunshine with temperatures in the 50s. And actually, right exactly where we should be for this time of year. And we go warmer tomorrow. Tracking a weak upper air disturbance that's exiting Colorado, getting ready for the next system that's moving on shore in California. But with high pressure anchored here in the storm track to the north, that means a warming and drying trend that'll see highs in the 60s tomorrow, 70s on Wednesday before this this storm brings a return of rain and snow just in time for your weekend figures, right? In the meantime tonight, nice. Get out if you can. Sun's still out and we've got 33 degrees will be your low tomorrow morning with light winds and a cool start to your day. Kids are going to want to wear shorts to school if they're not on spring break with upper 60s tomorrow, mid 70s on Wednesday. Rain showers Thursday mixing with snow Friday night. Storm is out of here Saturday, but a cool and windy start to the weekend. Saturday's high 42, but we're back to 50s with sunshine on Sunday afternoon. Kathy, thank you. It was the saddest story in all last week, honestly. That bald eagle near Littleton that lost its longtime mate right around the time of the blizzard. Well, guess who already has a new man in her life? That didn't take long. We touched base with the wildlife photographer, Winston Herbert, who has been watching that old eagle pair for years, and he reports that a new male companion was in the nest Friday morning. Herbert says he saw this Juvenile eagle, younger man, twice over the weekend. His neighbor saw the pair again this morning. So wait a second, if he was, if he was there last night and he was there again this morning, uh, it's really none of my business. Colorado Parks and Wildlife couldn't confirm for us that they do believe that this pair has now mated. They said it, it's not typical for an eagle to find a new mate within a week, but you know what? Listen, it's her life. Who are we to judge? Did you or anybody you know get engaged at Union Station over the weekend? Because if you did, Jeff Jordan from Cincinnati accidentally captured your proposal on video. He was in town and he was recording because Union Station is beautiful. And then he realized only afterwards that he had caught a proposal on tape. He heard the clapping. So he turned to the internet, posted it on Reddit looking for the couple. And at this point, still looking. I think it's very important to educate especially the young who are our future leaders. Future leaders learning a very personal history lesson. Let them know what uncontrolled hatred did and can do. And the most Colorado thing we've seen today is a very permanent loyalty pledge. Next.
Jack Adler is a Holocaust survivor who is intent on looking young Coloradans in the eye and asking them not to let the world forget the history that he witnessed. Our Byron Reed caught up with him in Parker. How were they affected? In Wendy Eckert's seventh grade language class. Why is it important for us to have all these different perspectives? They're learning a little bit more about history through books. In language class, we're actually reading a book thief, which is, takes place um, during the time of the Holocaust. Sam Koch is a student at Parker Court Knowledge Charter School, where they're not only reading about the past, but they're also bringing it to life. I speak to you as an eyewitness to one of the darkest pages in human history. 90-year-old Jack Adler is a Holocaust survivor from Poland, and for the past 10 years, he shared his experiences with this school seventh graders. Well, I was on the death march out of Dachau. I was 16, I wouldn't have made it one more day. And if you were unable to continue the march, they wouldn't leave you behind alive. I think it's very important to educate, especially the young who are our future leaders. Let them know what uncontrolled hatred did and can do. We were greeted by Nazi officers and soldiers with whips and dogs. Adler spent about five and a half years in Jewish ghettos and concentration camps, surviving on advice he got from his father. My father, every night in the barracks, told me when we went to sleep, this will end very soon. Don't give up hope if you want to see your loved ones again. And that's what kept me going. I spent age 10 to 16 in the Holocaust. And I'm the sole survivor of my immediate family of six. Adler hopes his life experiences can be a lesson for these students and the pages of his life will keep this part of history alive. Definitely very interesting to like here and how scary it was. For next? Sad part of history, unfortunately, but it's something we have to educate so we don't repeat it. I'm Byron Reed. Adler figures that since 1992, he shared his story with about a million and a half people. He speaks constantly to schools, civic groups, churches, and military groups around the world. The most Colorado thing we saw today must have hurt, but trust me, it's awesome. Less awesome, though, is how many of you are siding with Steve Steger over me in our Legal Eagle versus Legal Beagle debate. That's next.
The most Colorado thing we've seen today is some serious dedication to the hometown teams. Chris Gettler shared this photo of his newest tattoos. You got the state C and then the logos for the Rockies and the Avs and the old Broncos logo, the Nuggets logo. It kind of looks like it, it spells out Colorado. If you look at it real quick like that, Chris says it's a $300 tattoo and his guy's not done. Meyer Delgado is the one working on the tattoo and they're going to keep adding to it. Share the most Colorado thing you've seen with the hashtag Hey Next. We finish with your feedback. Lots of it on Legal Eagle versus Legal Beagle. I had never heard Beagle before today. Steve Steger says he had never heard Eagle. About 70% of you seem to be with me on this. Rosalind, though, is outraged that I was mean to Steve. She says correcting your colleague on air is unprofessional and rude. Rosalind, I hope it will make you feel better. Steve and I have been going back and forth in the office about this for hours. We knew exactly what was going to happen when we stepped out on air tonight. Jason writes that his wife was mad she forgot to say news out when she ran into me at the coffee shop today. So to Jason's wife and the rest of you, news out.